What's up, everybody? Welcome to this Tuesday edition of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can always follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. We are less than a handful of days away from Packers, Rams, divisional round, Lambeau Field, opportunity to go to the NFC Championship game. I absolutely cannot wait. Uh, but Brian Gutekunst is not yet done, still shaping his roster. He talks about it being a 365 day a year process to reshape his roster and give him, you know, give the team the best opportunity to win. Well, he did that again today. I'm going to be talking about the signing of Jared Valdir, of course. Before I get to that, just want to touch briefly on the college football championship, the national football championship from last night. Uh, first of all, I want to start with Devonte Smith, right? Just such a phenomenal college football career. And I know as he starts to transition to the NFL and the draft, all of the talk is going to be about his size. You know, he's probably about 170 pounds dripping wet. From the sounds of it, he's not going to be like the fastest 40 guy, um, certainly not in that 4-3, low 4-4 range. So, uh, you know, he's going to be an outlier of some extent. And I've heard the comparisons to like a Marvin Harrison, which I, you know, is I think an apt comparison, but man, he is just so talented out on the football field. And as I've said over time, my favorite wide receivers to watch, listen, the Randy Mosses, the Kelvin Johnsons, the Julio Jones, the AJ Greens, those players in their prime, I'm not taking anything away from them whatsoever. Those guys are freak athletes who can go up and play the position at a totally different level. And some of those guys, I mean, certainly Randy Moss, you know, they at at times really developed their route running as well and became, you know, full-fledged wide receivers. Julio Jones, another example of that. Kelvin Johnson became a better route runner through his career. But my favorites to watch are the ones that just put on a clinic with their route running. And Devontae Adams, certainly example of that as was Antonio Brown when he was in his prime. Stephon Diggs, another great example for Buffalo. These are not going to be your biggest, your tallest, your fastest, your most physical. These are going to be artists, savants, as I mentioned yesterday with Devontae Adams. These are going to be players that are just going to line up And it doesn't matter if it's Randy Ramsey, Deion Sanders, you know, who, you know, Akib Tlaib, Darrell Rivas, Nande Asamoa. It doesn't matter who's across from them. They are going to find a way to get open because they are going to attack every single part of your game. And it doesn't matter if you've got, you know, ridiculous hips, size, the ability to press at the line. They are going to find a way to attack your weaknesses and get into space. We've seen it from Devonte Adams for some time now. We've seen it from Stefan Diggs for some time now. Antonio Brown in his prime was, you know, nearly uncoverable at times. Those are the type of wide receivers that are so successful, and they're just artists. Terry McLaurin is is very similar in that regards, not to the same level, but just a, a ridiculous route runner. Um, I see a lot of that in Devonte Smith. So throw away the size, throw away the speed, throw away the physicality because he is a artist in the open field and and just how to break off his routes and how to get into space and how to attack cornerbacks. He's a master of his craft. He's so fun to watch and he put on a show in the national championship game. And then following that up, college football has got to figure out something, right? Like the same couple teams are going to be getting to the championship almost every single year. It certainly makes it anticlimactic. I like the implementation of the the four team uh, system. They probably need to go to at least eight and they have to figure out a way to level the playing field. I'm certainly open to suggestions. I don't have a great idea on how you do that, um, but something's got to give because the product on the field is much less enjoyable. And also the games are just ridiculously long. I've literally missed about the first hour and a half of the national championship game. And I I came downstairs to watch and they're still midway through the second quarter. Like that is insane. So the games are too long. They, you know, if we always talk about baseball and pace of play. College football has the most egregious pace of play issue going on right now. So that's that's got to find a way to change, and they've got to find a change a way to change the the playing field a bit. Because as of right now, it's just not a lot of fun seeing. You know, basically, is Clemson going to be there? And if so, maybe they can cha- you know challenge Alabama or those two go back and forth. But it's basically going to be Clemson or Alabama when it's all said and done, and that's not great for the sport. And uh, I think, again, they got to figure out a change there. But enough of that, enough college football. We'll definitely have uh, enough time to talk uh, talk about 
all the different great college football players as we transition to draft season after February, of course. But I uh, do want to talk more about Jared Valdir because there's been a lot of conversation. And if you've been paying attention, small humble brag here, um, I had made mention of the fact that, uh, on Twitter that uh, a couple weeks ago, had the Colts lost in their final regular season game, uh, that there was a possibility, and this was right after uh, David Bakhtiari had gone down with the injury, the, the Colts had just signed uh, Jared Valdir to actually start that final game in week seven against the Jaguars. Uh, the Colts needed to win in that game to get into the playoffs. And my comment at the time was with Bakhtiari going down, you know, in that week 17, one thing to cheer against was the Colts because it basically if, you know, either that or if all the rest of the AFC teams won, the Colts went to got in the playoffs. Had the Dolphins won, they would not have, but the Dolphins lost, the Colts win, and the Colts do get in the playoffs. But had they not, Green Bay would have had the opportunity uh, to take him off of their practice squad immediately and bring him on for the playoffs. And uh, that could have been a really big signing. But unfortunately at the time, the Colts again did make the playoffs, so he wasn't available. And in fact, they bring him up off the practice squad. They elevate him off the practice squad, put an asterisk next to that because it's very important. He starts at left tackle again in the first playoff game. And uh, ultimately they lose to the Bills and the game was over. And at the time I said, keep an eye out for Jared Valdir because he was on their practice squad. I know he was elevated, but the Packers still may be able to poach him off. Now, full transparency, not 100% sure on the rule at the time. This was uncharted territory a bit because uh, this is the first time that we've ever had a situation where teams could elevate players and in the practice off the practice squad and play them in postseason games. Um, but my thought process at the time was that yes, the regular season roster, that the roster, the 53 man roster freezes when your season's over. I didn't believe that to be the case for the practice squad. So before I had recommended that, I went out and just triple checked to make sure that, uh, you know, Jared Valdir, in fact, was elevated off the practice squad and not signed off the practice squad because those are two totally different things that have a massively huge difference here. Had he been signed to the active 53 man roster instead of elevated from the practice squad, he would have been a core member of the team. And once the playoff game was done and they lost, he would have been frozen on that roster. It's the same reason why you know, Larry Fitzgerald, who's going to retire, the Cardinals can't say, well, you know what, we're going to cut Larry so he can go and sign with some other team and have a chance at a Super Bowl ring in his last season. Doesn't work that way. Uh, obviously, that would give a competitive advantage to only one team who would get to pick up a Larry Fitzgerald. So you, you can't do that. Once your season's over, your roster, your 53-man roster is frozen. But again, the same uh, ends up in, I was ultimately correct in my assumption, the same cannot be said for your practice squad. The practice squad players can still be signed to active rosters for teams who are in the playoffs. It's one opportunity to still fill your roster. So basically what happens here, Valdir gets signed by the Colts to their practice squad. He plays in two games, including in their playoff game. Um, in those two games, he was elevated off their practice squad, not signed. At the end of both of them, he goes back to their practice squad, which in this scenario, because he wasn't on their 53. He does not freeze with the rest of their roster. He's part of their practice squad. So Green Bay can then poach him off of the Colts practice squad and sign him to the active roster and play him in the playoffs, uh, which is crazy. No, no player, is, as far as I'm aware, uh, and I think Schefter tweeted this as well, has ever played for two different teams in the same playoffs. It's basically been an impossibility for the entire history of the NFL, but Brian Gutekunst found a way to work that system. Kudos to him. I think he's just reading my tweets. If we're being real, that's, I'm not being serious, but uh, you know, they did a great job. They found loopholes. And it's again, another example of Brian Gutekunst using 365 days a year to try to improve his roster. And kudos to Goot for finding Tavon Austin, Snacks Harrison, and Jared Valdir just in the last, what, month and a half, who all could play roles for the Packers come this postseason, which obviously leads us to the next question is, what role does Jared Valdir play? And uh, I think the first question that needs to be answered is, can he play this weekend? And assuming he followed the protocols... And it sounds like, I think Bill Huber reported that he actually drove uh, by himself from Indianapolis to Green Bay, which means he was in uh, in the protocols in Indianapolis, drove by himself, which is part of the equation. You can't fly with a bunch of other people on the plane. Uh, they either say you have to fly charter or uh, you know drive on your own. You, you can't travel with others. So he drove to Green Bay on his own, would pick up the pr protocols back in Green Bay, which would make him eligible to play this weekend, very similar to Snacks Harrison uh, you know, playing in week 17. Uh, it, it's basically an apples to apples comparison. So yes, he would be available to play, which then begs the question, should he be playing? Should he be starting? 
And I think here the answer is no. I think to get a guy in probably may, may be practicing on Tuesday, but probably not practicing until Wednesday. Um, just getting to know some of those guys. I know he knows the system, but he'd probably be kicking to left tackle, not right tackle where he played in Green Bay a season ago. I think that's really short notice to all of a sudden, you know, up the apple cart, if you will, and start from scratch and have him be your starting left tackle when this offensive line has played pretty damn well all season long. So I don't, I don't think you go in that direction. That being said, it does give you options as the game goes along. So let's play this out, right? So let's say Green Bay lines up Turner, Jenkins, Corey Lindsley, Lucas Patrick, and uh, Rick Wagner again as their starting five. Well, what happens if LA singles out Lucas Patrick on, at right guard and he's just getting beat and he can't hang with Aaron Donald? Well, you could solidify that interior of the offensive line by kicking Billy Turner to right guard and starting, you know, not starting, but putting in Jared Valdir at left tackle and making sure that you've got Jenkins, Corey Lindsley, and Billy Turner on the interior to deal more with Aaron Donald and make, you know, make Leonard Floyd and Agbo Okoronkwo beat you on the outside against, you know, Rick Wagner and Jared Valdir. That could be an option. I don't think they start that way, but I think it gives them an option if things start going astray. I do think he comes in and is immediately the number one offensive lineman off the bench from day one, from from this weekend uh, from, against the Rams. I, I think, you know, should, um, let's just kind of go one by one. Should Billy Turner go down at left tackle? I think you would just simply put um, Jared Valdir into that role. Should uh, Elton Jenkins go down at left guard? I think you probably move Valdir to left tackle, Billy Turner to right guard, and swap Lucas Patrick over to left guard and move him in for Turner. Should Lindsley get hurt? You move uh, Elton Jenkins into center, probably Lucas Patrick to left guard, Billy Turner to right guard, and Jared Valdir at left tackle. Should your right guard go out? Uh, Should Lucas Patrick go out? Billy Turner to right guard, Jared Valdir at left tackle. And then the the last one that's interesting, if Rick Wagner goes out, you have a choice, basically. You can put Jared Valdir at right tackle and keep Billy Turner at left tackle or put Billy Turner at his natural right tackle position and put Vildir at left tackle. But either way, I think he's definitely the next one up off the bench, moving John Runyon Jr. down a spot. And I think that will be your depth going forward. And again, it could give Green Bay some options in this game against the Rams. If things start to go you know, wrong on the interior, that they could put Vildir out at left tackle, solidify things with Billy Turner, and hopefully have him have better success against Aaron Donald and that that Rams defensive line than maybe Lucas Patrick was having. I have faith in Lucas Patrick. I think he can get that job done as well, you know, as, as it can be expected against an Aaron Donald and a Michael Brockers and that entire Rams line. But uh, again, it just gives Green Bay some options as soon as this Saturday. So I think uh, that's kind of the main thing. Oh, I did have a chance as well to go and look at his tape. I haven't had a chance yet to go and look at his tape against the Bills. I'm going to look at that tomorrow and I'll report back tomorrow on it. Uh, But I did get a chance to go through all of his tape from his week 17 game against Jacksonville. And the first thing I was looking for is how were his movement skills, right? His movement was great. He didn't look labored at all. He looked fresh. He looked like he had fresh legs, which he should. He hasn't played, but also he hasn't practiced. It was his first game. You know, it was pretty crazy how active he was executing cut blocks, getting to linebackers, aggressive linebackers on the second level. I think he got to Miles Jack, if I remember correctly, a corner blitz off the edge. He got out and cut him. Like he, there was one play, he opened up a running lane by throwing the defensive lineman to the side. Um, I did think he wore down a little bit in that week 17 game as the game went on, as he started playing into the 50 and 60 snap range. Um, You could see, you know, he just didn't look like he was fully in game shape and you could just tell the difference. He was really playing well at the beginning of that game. And at the end, even though, you know, they were running the ball well at that point, you could just tell he was wearing down a little bit. I think now with playing a wild card game and now, you know, this being his third game, you would expect that to kind of wear off a little bit and him start getting kind of his, you know, back in playing shape a little bit. So I think there's a great, great, great signing by Good at this point. I mean, again, at this point, you only had John Runyon Jr. And then I think Ben Braden would have been the next player up. I don't think it would have been Yash Nijman. I don't think it would have been Simon Stepaniak. I don't, I don't think they have the full trust in those guys yet. Ben Braden's played in NFL games. I think it would have been John Runyon Jr. and then Ben Braden as your next two to now have Jared Valdir, who's already legitimately started at left tackle in a playoff game this year. Uh, what a signing by Goot, and it just uh, gives Green Bay a little bit more depth and some more options up front. So 
That's going to do it for me. Make sure to check out the podcast tomorrow. I'll be right back here on YouTube. Subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, make sure to check out Matt Dan, uh, Matt, Dan, and Janelle as they break down the Jared Valdir signing and some of the key uh, storylines as we go into Packers Rams. Uh, but that's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for following. And until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.